Good afternoon, everyone. Masal Khair and hello to, to everybody. Welcome to our webinar on Introduction to Transfer Pricing under UAE Corporate Tax. This is the fifth seminar on UAE Corporate Tax, which we are conducting to touch upon various areas in this tax regime. In case you'd like to access recording of our previous session, please visit our YouTube channel or you can vis visit our website. So, so today's session is focused on touching upon basically two, two areas. First, we'll be talking a bit on the basic points on the corporate tax, and then we'll go into detailed discussion on the expected transfer pricing rules for which we have expert speakers with us today. I like to highlight that many countries in Middle East has already implemented transfer pricing and arms length principles such as Saudi, Qatar, Oman, Egypt, and recently Jordan. So this is another UA is going to join uh, uh, that, that league. So, so far, as you might have know that you has published only public consultation document on corporate tax and the law is expected to come anytime soon. So we expect that to be in a few days time. Uh, that's that's what been informed by the ministry. Right, so some basic information about Premier Brains. Uh, Premier Brains was established about 10 years back in Dubai and currently has offices in Abu Dhabi in UAE. Internationally, we are present in Oman and Kuwait. Our business is divided into four core elements. First is audit, where we do external audit, internal audit, due diligence, liquidations, fraud investigations, for example. Then tax and compliance. We are tax agents of federal tax authorities and work extensively on VAT, excise, double taxation avoidance agreements, transfer pricing, ESR, AML, and now corporate tax. Account, we do accounts outsourcing and CFO services on, us, uh, on various assignments. We, we have a department on advisory where we do MA consulting, valuations, policy manuals, business plans, feasibility studies, and many more areas in that, that line of business. Our motto is to always doing the right thing, and our goal is to become an international brand name. Today, we have two speakers. Uh, first session will be conducted by Sneh Lohia, who is working as a consultant with us. He's a chartered accountant and ICAW qualified with over 20 years of post qualification experience. He will be our first speaker followed by Rishi Agarwal, who is one of our office partner, who is a, who is a chartered accountant as well, with, over, with around 20 years post-qualification experience. And uh, the seminar with, uh, will be ending with me, will be like talk a little bit about how to plan for the introduction of this law. Just to give you a brief introduction about myself, I am a CA and MBA uh, with certification in AI, ML and forensics. My previous experience include working with Big Four, Private Equity, and last year, last 10 years with Premier Brains as a partner. So now, before I hand over to the first speaker, I'd like to say, if you have any questions, please feel free to write in the chat window or, or in the Q&A session. And before I hand over, I just want to run a quick poll just to see the experience of the audience. Um, so if you can, please give your votes quickly, and then we can go into the session. Superb, so I'll end the poll and share the results. So there are a few, few of us who knows transfer pricing very well, which is great, but there, there's a large population who has not worked on it. So let's, let's begin the session. So Sne, please take over from here. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And thanks, Rishi, for uh, handing over. So today, as you, as uh, Rishi has told, we will understand some basics about transfer pricing. And as my uh, poll result shows that many of you have not worked on it. So I'll try to uh, make it simple and understandable so that uh, everybody is clear about what transfer pricing is and how it works. So, as you know that on 31st of January, UAE came with, so this is my agenda introduction, then we will see the implication of UAE corporate tax, that how it uh, interacts with transfer pricing, and then practical challenges for transfer pricing. 
So as you know all that 31st of January was the day when UAE announced that income tax or rather better to say corporate tax would be uh, coming up from 1st June 2023. So we'll start with that, that what has come uh, in, the, uh, in the announcement and further what they have detailed out in the public consultation document. So they, they have imposed tax not on in individuals, but on businesses. So anybody having commercial or any business license, which also includes the freelancers visa uh, so licenses. So if somebody is you know, on an individual basis has taken any freelancing license and working under that, that is also covered under corporate taxes. But individuals who are getting salaries or other income, they are not covered as of now. What are the tax slabs? So uh, UAE has come out with a threshold of 375K. Till 375K, this percentage is zero. Above that, it's 9%, which is one of the minimum in the world. Then for the large MNCs, which have a, a turnover or revenue of Euro 750 millions or above, they will be subject to the minimum uh, tax rate as per the uh, special rate, which is there for large multinationals as per OECD guidelines. So, uh, which will be 15%. So the so there are three rates now till 375k it's zero percent 375k or above nine percent and then for large mncs it is 15 percent and these are all prospected so law is yet to come but this has been proposed from when it will start june 1 2023 so any financial year starting after june 1 2023 the tax will be applicable and one more important thing, which is to be noted is that for the free zones, there is some concession if they meet the requirements of free zone, which is generally that they don't do any business with mainland. Then FTA can give them tax incentive if they satisfies all the conditions of being in the free zone. Okay, so these are the main highlights we, uh, we thought of sharing before we start with transfer pricing. Now, with the transfer pricing, uh, with the corporate tax comes the transfer pricing guidelines, which were also part of the uh, consultation document, public consult document, which came in somewhere in April, and uh, which will be uh, the which will be result in the final regulations coming up some anytime soon. So, with that, we came out with the transfer pricing rules as well. So this make it very much essential to understand transfer pricing because it shows that UAE is coming out with the corporate taxes and also on the on transfer pricing along with that. So we need to understand what is transfer pricing. Price which is applied or proposed to be applied in the transactions between related parties or associate persons or enterprises. Now, transfer pricing is something which is happening now also. We have lots of all the companies or most of the companies have group companies to which they are interacting through financial transactions. It can be they are selling some goods or they are providing some services or uh, they have some funding received. So all this, this is under, uh, coming under the scope of transfer pricing. Now, what it exactly, the price which is applied when you do any transaction with your related party or associated enterprises. That is named as transfer pricing. Now, why it is important now? Because now we will be having taxes and these transactions will be questions by, questioned by tax authorities because these transactions are done between people who have, or companies who have common control. And when anyone, uh, when two entities have common control, then these prices can be influenced because uh, charging high or low on the other, one side will not affect the, their total profitability. So that's why it becomes very important. And more to take advantage of different tax rates in different locations. So if on different locations, there are different tax rates, then people would be inclined to 
keep profits high on less tax countries and uh, low profits and high rated high taxed countries so that's why the transfer pricing becomes very very important when the company is having tax loss so if you see if a parent company is on one one side of a geography or globe and there is another subsidiary company on some other country and they are transferring some goods and services so it needs to be checked whether the price is price is appropriate now what is this appropriate price means can somebody answer me you can put your answers in the chat box so what does this appropriate price means so appropriate price should be something which is which uh, somebody who is not linked or not related will do right so let's see what is uh, let's understand this with the help of an example so transaction between unrelated entities company a in india sells a product to company b in ua and the price they charge is usd 90 now cost of the product or the cost of the company a is only usd 40 company b which has purchased from indian company in uae that sells further this product to the retail client at usd 100 and these two transactions is company a and company b are unrelated parties okay so what so that means uh, b would be taking at a price which is a market price maybe other company will also give it the same price now because of this transaction let's uh, see below what happens so company a in india which is subject to a uh, approximately 25% tax which is the corporate tax rate in india now they have a cost of usd 40 right and they sell the goods at usd 90 so how much is their profit 90 minus 40 50 which will be taxed at the rate of 25% 12.5 would be the tax now what will happen to company b company b because they are buying a uh, goods which is manufactured they are just buying and selling so they will be earning a trading profit basically so what will be their profit so they they got the product in 90 they sold it at 100 so 100 minus 90 10 is their profit and which will be taxed at the uae proposed rate which is 9 9% maybe right now it is 0% okay so this is a transaction which shows how the transactions happen between an unrelated ent entity now if they are related this company a and p are related then what will happen and before that this appropriate price is called arms length price because this is done between unrelated party who don't have any interest on each other and the price is market value or you can say a fair value which will be charged now let's see what happens when the party become uh, related so now what is happening in this situation is company a in india sells the product to ua retail customer at same price 100 but he is uh, selling it through a ua subsidiary so what uh, company a will do they will sell the product to ua subsidiary and then ua subsidiary will sell to the client or final retail customer now the cost of the product was same 40 for the manufacturer company a and they sells this to ua subsidiary at 45 okay so just they keep a 5 dollar margin because both are entities owned by the same same owner company a is a parent and company b is the subsidiary so they can influence the price instead of going for a market price so the company a which is a parent company it keeps only 5 dollar as profit for 40 was their cost 45 was their selling price to company b so they pay a tax of 25% on simply on dollar 5 instead of dollar 50 now see what happens in the ua subsidiary company in ua they have they are subject to uh, right now 0% or proposed would be 9% and cost they have is 45 dollars because they buy buy at 45 now how much they are selling at 100 
So the profit is coming here. If they are now having a $55 profit instead of the $10 which they have when it was unrelated transaction. Now this $55 would be subject to 9%. So if, if I go again back to the slide, you see the difference. Here $50 was charged at 25% and 10 at 9%, right? Now things have changed here and five has become 25% and 55 has become 9%. So this is how uh, 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 pe some people can take advantage of tax differences in the countries. And that's why the regulations are there for transfer pricing. And uh, the countries want to, the tax authorities of every country want to ensure that there's no such kind of manipulation done in the prices because the, the entities are controlled by a common owner. Okay, so that is all. Uh, logic of why we need to uh, study transfer pricing and why uh, there are so much regulations about transfer pricing. There are uh, uh, more than 100 countries in the world which have transfer pricing regulations on. So let's see what are the transfer pricing rules. Purpose. Purpose of transfer pricing rule is to ensure that the price is not influenced. So as we saw in the example, it, the price was influenced. So it regulations want to ensure that price is not influenced by the relationship between the parties involved. Arm's length. Arm length is the price which is not influenced. So if you, anybody want to, everybody want to ensure that the transfer pricing is being done on arm's length. So UAE will apply the internationally recognized arm's length principles to transactions and arrangements between related parties and with connected persons. So in the consultation document, if you anybody would have seen, they have already come out with what uh, they will follow. They will be following the OECD guidelines. Anybody here can tell me the full form of OECD? So OECD is actually the organization where, where we 137 countries are uh, part of it and UAE has also signed the uh, their BEPS and uh, whatever tax, minimum tax arrangement agreement in 2018 itself and all these corporate tax and all which is coming up is part of that. So OECD has come out with this uh, tax consultation document uh, which FTA has released has told that they will be following the OECD guidelines for TP regulations and they will follow the process for all the international transactions as per OECD rules. And it is expected that the same will follow for domestic transactions as well. What is arm length price? We already saw, uh, see it is price which is applied or proposed to be applied in a transaction between unrelated persons in unrelated conditions. What is connected person? So connected person has been uh, explained in also in detail. So they are uh, those people who are connected in some or the other way. So payments or benefits provided by a business to its connected persons will be deductible only if the business can demonstrate that the payment or benefit corresponds with the market value of the service provided. So again, arm length pricing, the market value. It, it incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of taxpayer business. So you have to justify why this expenses is required and what is related party. So threshold of 50% or more shareholding or control is required. A taxpayer and its branch or permanent establishment or PE you can say. Partners in the same unincorporated partnership and exempt and non-exempt business activities of same person. Also, it says that uh, they will take for the related party up to the four kinship uh, relationship criteria. That means like uh, parent, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather. These four uh, persons in the lineal and uh, descendant and uh, further this kind of uh, relationship would be covered. Further details will be coming in the upcoming laws, but now this is the guidance that four level of kinship would be allowed. 
in addition to that whatever is the general criteria like spouse children uh, spouse uh, sis, um, like a spouse brother sister all those criteria would also be there uh, okay and then we will try to understand what is the transfer pricing process so once we know that we have a transfer pricing requirement or we have a transaction which triggers with the transfer pricing, we need to follow a transfer pricing process, which is a quite uh, technical process, but let's try to understand it uh, in a simplified way. So it goes like this. First, there has to be a transaction, which is a control transaction, means this is a transaction between two group companies. Once we know that, we need to do a functional analysis of uh, which we will see what is functional analysis. Once the functional analysis is done, on that basis, we need to do an economic analysis, which is uh, more about uh, benchmarking and conclusion. So economic analysis will lead to the next step, which is following the different methods of transfer pricing and then benchmarking your company or your transaction and finding out a conclusion. And lastly comes the documentation. So whatever analysis you do, functional, economic, benchmarking, that needs to be documented in a, in a format which is given by the OECD and the taxation authorities and which will be required maybe to be on which basis the filing would be required of the transfer pricing report. Okay, so let's see what are the control transactions first. So any guesses or any example anybody would like to give before I uh, come out with the slide. What do you now, what do you understand by the transactions, control transaction and what kind of examples you can give or what is being done in your company, which can be covered in a control transaction. I'm expecting some answers. Please put in your chat box. I hope I'm clear to you what is a related party transactions and control transactions. Okay, so let's see what are control transactions. So it can be a transfer of goods and services like uh, anything if you're selling any goods to the related party or you're providing any services or you are <coughs> receiving rent or giving rent to a related party or group company, royalty, same way for any uh, trademark or any um, intangibles. Transfer of intangibles. So if like there are brands, know-how, trademarks, which are being transferred to a uh, associated company, that will also a control transaction. Intra-group services. So services like admin, HR, finance services are handled by sometimes by the parent in, in also for other group companies. So that is also covered in the intra-group services. And another major important part of control transaction is the financial transactions happening between group companies. So it can be financing or giving loans or giving guarantees or Cash pool like cash is handled by every every cash is handled by one entity. All decisions made by the one of the parent company or one of the group companies. So all these transactions would be subject to, or they are subject to two P and they are called control transactions. Next uh, step in the process is functional analysis. What is functional analysis? So actually, it is about three W's, why, what, and how. So whatever is the transaction which is happening, we need to analyze the transaction. That why it's happening, what is actually happening, and how it's happening. Okay, and that is done through the three-stage functional analysis, which is called FAR, FAR analysis. It is also called FAR analysis. It's about functions, assets, and risk. Now, what is functions? Functions is like what function is done by which entity. So obviously there would be two entities because there, uh, there is a transaction between two group companies, right? So there would be a company who is uh, providing the good, selling the goods to company, other group company or 
the company is providing services to other group company or they are uh, doing some financial transaction between them. So we need to do analysis of how and which functions are done by which company. So for example, let's say a company uh, which is a parent company is buying some goods from a subsidiary company in some other country. Okay, and that other company, which is a subsidiary company, is a ma doing manufacturing transactions. So now manufacturing happening at one place and that manufactured product is being sold to a parent company in other country. Now we need to analyze ki when these, this transaction is happening, which function is performed by which company. So manufacturing is performed by the uh, subsidiary company. But within that manufacturing, who is taking the decisions? So deciding a uh, function like what will be produced and how much will be produced, who is taking that decision? At what price it will be sold? Who, would, who is taking that decision? How the process of production will happen? What quality of product would be produced? Who is taking that uh, decision? Who is marketing that product? All these different kind of functions. Who is uh, controlling the quality? This is all covered in the functions. Assets. Now the assets which are used for production, we have to analyze that. Ki who is the owner of that, those assets? Who is holding uh, the rights to maintain that asset? Who can uh, take the decisions about that asset? And who is financing those assets? All these decisions are uh, analyzed in, in the asset criteria. And last one is the risk. Now, what comes into risk? Risk is all about who is taking the risk, who is taking uh, the risk of uh, default in production, if the quality of production is not correct. Who is taking the risk that if product is not sold, then uh, whose profit will reduce, whether it's a subsidiary A, who is subsidiary B, who is producing, or parent who is buying the goods and services. Similarly, who is taking the risk of uh, damage in the goods? Who is taking the financial risk? So all those kind of analysis is done in the functional analysis. Once this analysis is done, the next stage is economic analysis. Now, what is economic analysis all about? So babe, this analysis is based on your functional analysis. So because we already have done here the functional analysis, we will know that what is happening how is happening and why it's happening. Now, we need to see who is the tested party here. So whenever we go for, uh, you can say, a transaction is being identified for TP and we need to justify that this transaction is not at a price which is influenced, but it is at a market value or it's arm length price, then we have to prove it, right? Uh, behind the test, uh, testing authority or you can say behind the tax authorities. So for that purpose, a testing party is selected out of the two parties. So here in our example, there was a company A, uh, parent company and company B, which was a subsidiary company. So we need to decide here who is the tested party which we want to choose for. So the company can choose their tested party which can be later challenged by tax authorities, but uh, a company will first choose who is the tested party. And then they will see all the transaction from their angle. So let's say in my example, I choose the manufacturing company, which is uh, the subsidiary company who is doing the actual manufacture work as a tested party. And that tested party now has to prove that the price which uh, they are charging to the parent company is proper or not. So the next step is selection of most appropriated method. So this is the method they have to decide. There are six methods actually, which uh, can be used for doing the transfer pricing analysis. So they will analyze those methods and they will choose the most appropriated method, which is called MEM in short. And also they will choose the profit level indicator. So once the MAM is uh, chosen, they, so some of the methods don't require PLI, but some of the methods require PLI. So if the method requires a PLI to be decided, 
then they will choose the PLI also. PLI is nothing but the uh, benchmarking of profit levels. So let's say the manufacturing company is earning a profit of um, a gross profit of let's say 50%. Okay. So whether this gross profit is justified, how much is their uh, competitors are getting, are they getting less or more? This is uh, called a selection of profit level indicator. Some companies may choose net profit some companies may choose some uh, profitability on the unit basis, depending on the business. So once we have selected the most appropriate method and profit level indicator, the next step is to do the benchmarking. Benchmarking is a very crucial step in the process where we have to show that our transaction, uh, the price at which our transaction is happening is actually appropriate and we can show that this is the benchmark see there also the same price is being charged or there uh, the other uh, example or benchmarking where also the same profit level is chosen okay so we need to search for the benchmarking and there are different tools available for that different databases are available which help in doing it is a little technical there are different methods for this uh, but it is very uh, much a required step in justifying the transfer price which we are charging. So for this benchmarking, we have these different methods. As I said, there are six methods which are there. First one is comparable uncontrolled price method, which is called cup method. And this is the most uh, popular method you can say. So wherever uh, a cup is available, cup method is available. Uh, it's bet good to follow cup method because it's a, it's, it's a method which shows that same kind of transaction which is, uh, which is there through an uncontrolled entity. That is, this they are charging the same price. If we can prove that, nothing like that, right? Another method which is there is resale price method which is uh, applicable on some specific cases where the resale is happening for the same product. Cost plus method. This is mainly for the uh, production activities or manufacturing act activities where or construction act activities where some uh, margin of the cost is charged as the uh, added to the uh, to arrive at the selling price. And all these methods would be discussed in detail by my colleague later. So I'm just giving you an introduction. Next method is transaction net margin method, which is again a very popular method because uh, if these first three methods are not applicable, then this method can be applied to a wide variety of cases. And these last two are the uh, methods which are used in extreme cases when no other method is available. So transactional profit split method is uh, used for some specific sale made by the entities like um, some uh, sale of the, you can say intangibles, where there is no benchmarking available through cup method or cost plus method or transactional net margin method. So then this is applied and other method is where all the five are not available and some, it is a very peculiar, peculiar time transaction and some other method uh, is best suited in that method, then this can be applied or maybe combination of one or two methods can be applied here. Okay, so hope uh, everyone is clear about the methods. So next uh, thing which we would discuss is what is the documentation requirement? So there are three tire documentation requirement, which is master file, local file and CBCR. And again, I'm not spending much time because my colleague would be spending time on this in uh, too much detail. Now, once we have understood the basics, let's see what is the impact of corporate tax on transfer pricing. So when uh, transfer pricing was always there, but every time group companies were charging some prices, but nobody was questioning that. But now in the corporate tax scenario, intergroup transactions will be subject to TP regulations. So now because this regulation was not there earlier, now the regulations will be there in place. So 
it will be questions. So maybe you are following the transfer pricing still uh, because you have group transaction, but nobody was seeing that. Now it will be monitored. It will be uh, questioned. It will be, uh, you'll be required to file transferizing reports. So it will be subject to regulations. Documents justify transfer price is in line with arm's length pricing. So you have to justify that you have documents and the documents are justifying your transfer price that they are in line with arm's length. If you cannot justify that, there may be uh, impact of that. Submission of transfer pricing report for the group transactions. Maybe that you have to, as you have to prepare three tire documents and then different countries have different uh, filing requirements, different forms, different kind of reports. So if, uh, if you have a transfer pricing transaction that is group transaction, maybe you have to submit a transfer pricing report along with the tax returns. Tax and penalties, fines on unjustified expenses or understated incomes. So you may have to face tax penalties, fines if there are found transactions which are uh, which are resulting in unjustified expenses. That means reducing the income or understated income, which is again reducing the income and reducing the tax uh, revenue of the authority. Now see, let's understand again how in international scenario, the implication would be there for the tax transfer pricing. So if you see that in GCC itself, we have three, six countries having different type of tax rates. So we are not considering here rest of the world, but if you see the, just the example of GCC countries, Saudi Arabia has 20%, Bahrain is yet to come out with tax, Oman 15%, Qatar 10%, Kuwait again 15% and UAE has proposed 9%. So now what happens when we have different type of tax rates? So if you read this, tax rates are different between countries and therefore there is a strong incentive. The com companies who are present in all these locations, they have a strong incentive to shift income to a lower tax currency, a country, lower tax country and deductions to a higher tax country so that their overall tax effect is minimized for a company which operates in various jurisdictions. So the company who is in only one jurisdiction, they will not do anything because they are only at one place. But MNCs which are present in all these regulations they will be, they will start thinking, ki, okay, this country has more tax. Why, why I put my profit in this, uh, in this country, I should shift it to the other country because there I have to pay less tax. So again, I will repeat the same example here. If you remember the example, which I discussed in the beginning. So here, if you see a uh, tax rate was 25% in one country in India and 9% in UAE. And that's why the, the parent company had influenced the price to $45. $45 is not a market value because they are just taking a $5 profit at their cost of 40. So this kind of tax avoidance happens when a multinational com com company is operating in different tax jurisdictions having different tax rates. But how about the domestic companies? Can they also do tax avoidance? If we see that, yes, that is also possible. So if you see here the domestic scenario of UAE, so UAE can have a free zone company and a mainland company. Now, if we go back to the corporate tax uh, rules which have been announced uh, and the public consultation document which has come, it says that a free zone company who uh, meets the eligibility criteria, they can be subject to 0% tax and the mainland 9%. Now, again, the group, again, the owner who has having these two com companies as their group companies, he will be incentivized if uh, he shift or he or she, or she shift the profit to 0% zone, right? They will be saving 9% tax. So that's why because of two different companies having two different rate of tax in the same country that can also face transfer pricing.
because that is that will also result in tax avoidance. So if you understand, uh, we see we have an example to understand this. So let's say parent company in mainland, UAE provider uh, UAE provides HR, IT, and finance services to free zone company, which is also in UAE. Now, this is a group transaction, right? Parent company is providing these uh, uh, HO services of HR, IT, and financial to the group company, which is a subsidiary. And they are not charging anything. They are not allocating any charges for this. So what will happen? The mainland company, which is subject to 9% tax, their income is reduced, right? Which, which they would have, income would have been there if they are charging them for these services. That means their tax liability is reduced and they are uh, doing some uh, some taxes not going to the FTA because they are not charging. Now, if you see the subsidiary company side, they are charging, they are subject to 0% tax because they are eligible uh, as per the free zone rule. Now, they have more income because they have not been charged by parent, right? So if they have more income, they should be charged tax on that but because they are subject to zero percent tax their tax liability is not affected so that means keeping more income in subsidiaries useful for the owner there nothing will be affected and here they will in parent company they will save the tax so this kind of tax avoidance can be subject to transfer pricing regulations because fta will question these kind of transactions and now let's see what kind of practical ch challenges we can face when we when we uh, implement the transfer pricing in UAE in the uh, in the upcoming years. So these are the practical challenges possible. So justifying TP of group transactions in UAE without any any functional and economic analysis supporting arms length pricing. So if you don't have any such analysis done beforehand, and uh, uh, we will we'll try to justify that RTPs as per the arms length, it may be very difficult because o OECD guidelines, which you are going to follow, they give a proper process of functional and economic analysis and documentation. So we need to prepare for that. All transactions of UA entity with group companies in other countries will be within the scope of TP and needs harmonization with TP regulations of group entity countries. So this, this, is, this will be the challenge for those companies who are already following uh, TP regulations in other countries because they are multinational companies. And now they, they have to harmonize their policies, transfer pricing policies and documentation with the UAE because now UAE is also upcoming with the transpising rules and regulations. So they have to harmonize, they have to think over how, how uh, the those things which are being followed in other countries, how it can be challenged by the UAE authorities as per the rules which they are upcoming. Third challenge can be analyzing transactions within local companies, like the example which we took, free zone versus mainland, for the intra-group transactions, including intra-group services, to avoid disallowances and TP implications. So these companies were not doing anything on TP. So this is a new thing for them, but because there are two types of tax rates coming up in UAE, it will be subject to TP regulations most probably, and they need to prepare for that. And last but not the least, financial transactions between associated enterprises subject to TP rules needs to be revisited. So right now, many uh, financial transactions are happening between group companies because there is no TP, there is no taxes. So uh, companies are giving any kind of loans. The long uh, There are no agreements for those kind of advances and loans, but all this has to be uh, revisited and agreements needs to be prepared. And we need to see whether they are on arm's length pricing or not. And in the last, I have put some TP risk, which can be identified through, through these pointers. So if you have any of these, you need to uh, be alert and think over that what kind of TP you are following and is it arm or not. 
So are there any sale purchases of goods and services with group companies? If not, then there's no risk because you are not doing any transaction with the group companies. But if yes, you have to think of whether the two entities, countries have different tax rates and tax rules. So if, the, if we are doing group transactions, we have to see that whether the two jurisdictions have different tax rates because that is a trigger for doing the tax planning and tax avoidance. Are the transactions done at market price? If you're doing the transaction at market price, it's very good, no TP, uh, no TP implications, but are they at market price? We need to check. Are the transactions supported by agreement or documents? If yes, it's a good start point for TP, but if there is no documents, agreements, first you have to make that then only we can go ahead. Whether any funds received given to the group companies? So are you having these intergroup transactions? Have you given loan or you have given uh, funds without naming them as loan or you are given guarantees, et cetera, to different countries uh, in the different companies? So this needs to be checked. And whether any of the entity whether any of the entity is making continuous losses. So this is also a trigger point that whether any of your group entities with whom you are doing the transaction, are they doing any kind of, uh, are they running in losses? So that can be also a trigger point to check why they are into losses, but other companies are in profits, whether the transfer pricing is not at fair market value or arm's length pricing. So leaving you with this thoughts, I end my presentation here and will hand over to my colleague uh, Rishi Agarwal, who will take you through the further details of documentation and different methods. Thanks a lot for the patience uh, in, in listening to my uh, and uh, my slides and my whatever I spoke to. And if you have any questions, please share on chat box. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Neil, for the wonderful session and covering the topics on transfer price uh, met, uh, on the TP methodologies and on the documentation. Now I will share my screen. Just a second. Okay, guys. So I'll cover the topics for the TP methods and the documentation, and we will also discuss on the road ahead. Now, Sne mentioned that there are uh, six methods. I have broken down these three met uh, these methods into uh, the different uh, functions. Sorry. The, there are traditional transaction methods, which are basically the comparable uh, uncontrolled price method the resale price method and the cost plus method. Then there are transactional profit method, which is the transactional net margin method and the profit split method. And as always, the tax authorities keep a room with themselves for coming up with other methods where they can advise an, any method. So uh, as Sne mentioned that the comparable and controlled price method is the most popular method. We will first start discussing on the CUP method. Now, CUP method, first of all, understand why is it called CUP? Why is it called comparable and uncontrolled price? It is called comparable because it compares similar transactions in the market for goods which are uh, happening uh, for a similar uh, product. And then it is called uncontrolled because it covers transactions between uncontrolled entities and uh, between the control entities and the uncontrolled entities. So CUP method is of two types. One is the internal CUP and the external CUP. In internal CUP, the transactions between a related party and an unrelated party are considered as a base. Whereas for external cup, the transactions between unrelated parties is considered. We will, uh, the, uh, we will uh, cover this uh, method through various examples. So I'll take, I'll take you through example number one where we can see that an entity in UAE 
is uh, has purchased goods for 8100 and they have sold these goods to an entity b in usa a uh, control party for uh, 300 now entity b in usa has ultimately sold these goods to entity c which is an unrelated uh, party or a customer for 600 now i'll give you one minute through the uh, help of chat let's try to identify what would be the as per cup method what should be the price for transfer pricing for entity a appreciate if you can type your answers in the chat box i can see few answers are coming Okay, so the answers which I can see on the chat box are 300 and 600. Actually, the correct answer is 600 because if entity B was not there, then the price would have been 600, which entity A would have fetched as a selling price when they are selling the goods. This is called internal C CUP. I will again uh, repeat the same thing, internal CUP because an entity A is transacting with entity B, which is uh, a related party in this case, and then entity B is selling to entity C. Even if entity A sells to an unrelated party, it will still be an internal CUP because it is coming from the same company. Now we will take an example of an external CUP. An external CUP is uh, An entity D is selling to an entity E. Now, entity D is a company based in UAE, and uh, it is it has purchased the same goods for 100 and selling to entity E in USA for 600. Now, for transfer pricing purpose, if it is an external CUP, common uncontrolled uh, transaction, what would be the transfer pricing in this case? So let's again use the chat box and try to see if we come up with the right answer. Thanks, Nikunj. Both the times uh, your answer was correct. Is there any other person typing? Thanks, Moin. So I can see a lot of uh, answers coming in. For an external CUP, the answer is 600 in this case. So we can see uh, that for transfer pricing purpose, these are the two more. Uh, in CUP, we use ex internal and external CUP to determine. And based on that, we can determine the transfer pricing. We will take uh, one more example for a CUP, where we see that X is a manufacturer of washing machines and Y is a distributor of washing machines where both X and Y are owned by Z. So what price should X uh, charge to Y? It can be an internal CUP or an external CUP. So just uh, in the chat box, if you can type what should be the, uh, whether X should refer to internal CUP or external. Uh, external, I'm saying that the price charged by Z to other distributors and internal would be the price charged by X to other distributors. So if you can please type your answer. Yeah, I can see there are a lot of uh, answers coming on internal CUP, which is the correct answer. Even if uh, the external CUP is referred uh, that would also be acceptable if there is a proper documentation to justify it why we are referring to external CUP. 
now i can uh, see that uh, there's a good understanding on the cup method let's move to the another method now the second method which we are going to discuss for the tp for the transfer pricing is a resale price method the resale method resale price method means the price charged by an mne to a third party and the resale price is reduced by the gross margin to come up at the basic cost. Now, what is reduced, what, uh, it's not only the gross margin, but also the customs duties and taxes, if any, those are reduced to come at the arm's length price. Arm's length price is also called ALP for a quick uh, distinguishing. In resale price uh, method, we will take one example where a company in Canada is selling, uh, is manufacturing a goods uh, drink called Pyramid, and it is selling only to its related parties. It's not selling to any unrelated party. So in this case, the CUP method will not be applicable because there is no internal or external transaction happening uh, for this drink Pyramid. So whereas uh, there's another company selling a drink peak to unassociated distributors for USD 100 at a gross margin of $5 and they incur a custom duty of $2. So let's try to figure out what would be the transfer price in this case under the resale price method. So uh, I'll just go to the previous slide again. So the resale price is reduced by gross margin and the customs duty to come at the transfer price. So if you can please type your answers. Bingo, that's correct. So everyone has come up with the right answer. So the uh, so under the RPM method, we can see that the retail selling price is one hundred, the margin is five dollars, and the customs duty was two dollars. So the transfer price is ninety three. So therefore, A should charge ninety three dollars to its associated distributor for the transfer pricing purpose. Now the next method is the cost plus method, which is not widely used. The reason it is not widely used because the parameters uh, used to determine this method are not easily available. First of all, let's discuss what is cost plus method. This method evaluates the amount which is charged in a control transaction by reference to the gross profit markup realized in a comparable uncontrolled transactions. It simply means that the price charged by entity uh, uh, A to a related party, we compare it with the price charged by an unrelated party to an unrelated uh, buyer, and then um, try to figure out what is the margin which is, uh, which is generated in an unrelated transaction, and we apply the same margin on the cost of the related party transactions. So the, I'll uh, come to the example now. But the point here is that this is applicable in transactions where there, the market is well defined and the routine, the manufacturing activities are quite routine. So we take an example of uh, the most famous uh, iPhone 14 now, where a company X is manufacturing the cases and selling it to an associated partner. Now we know that this is a quite universal product and there are many companies involved uh, who are being ancillary to this, uh, to the iPhone products. So we know that there's one company B also in the market who is manufacturing similar uh, iPhone cases. Now company X is approached by an associated enterprise to manufacture 100,000 similar iPhone cases. When I say a similar iPhone cases of 100,000, we also look at the credit period, volume, transportation, all those things we look at to say that it's a similar transaction. Now company X has to, company X should find the cost of manufacturing for iPhone cases in the market by referring to another competitor for the, uh, for the margin and the cost which they are charging. Imagine company B is charging, is producing those uh, cases for $100 and selling it at $105. So 
So the margin in this case would be 5%. So company X has to apply the same margin of 5% on its cost of manufacturing to arrive for the purpose of transfer pricing. The reason this method is not very encouraged is because it's not easy to always get the market data. The next method is the transactional net margin method. The transactional net margin method, it can be applied. In this case, we compare the margins of transaction between two related parties and unrelated parties. Now, these margins of the comparable companies can be of any nature. It can be the operational margin where we can compare the operating profit to the net sales. We can compare the net cost plus or we can compare the return on capital employed. So there are different parameters which can be used to compare the uh, to come at the net profit margin method. We, we will take the net profit margin analysis with the help of an example here. A UK-based pharmaceutical company is selling products to a distributor in Germany. The German distributor has an operating margin of 4.5%. No internal or external transactions are available and nor it is possible to identify any gross margin information to allow an application of RPM method. A database research of companies performing similar functions was conducted, which resulted in an answer that the operating margin is between 1 to 7% and the median is 4%. So in this case, thus it can be concluded that the control transaction is consistent with the arm's length principle. The point here is that with the help of benchmarking and the, uh, and the economic analysis available in the market, these kind of transactions can be justified and the tax authorities are happy if the profit margin is within the range. They, uh, it can be between the corridor upper or lower, lower, but as far as it is within the corridor, it is acceptable to the tax authorities. So transactional net margin method is also very much popular and in use. The next is the transactional profit split method where the basic uh, return is attributed to routine uh, functions and the residual profit is allocated on the uh, relative contribution. This method is not uh, very popular and it the, this method evaluates whether the allocation of the combined operating profit or loss between two or more control transactions is at arm's length or not. For example, if a company, if a distributor is also giving credit facility or it is not giving a credit facility to the manufacturer, it's uh, difficult to compare sometimes. Or what functions are exactly performed between two related parties and the, how much profit should be split, it becomes sometimes difficult to argue and uh, split the margins based on the functions. It comes back to the FAR analysis what Sne has discussed. And this method is therefore uh, quite debatable and uh, not very popular. So the practical uh, considerations is, uh, it is very much driven by facts and circumstances of each case. And it's difficult to measure total profit from controlled transactions uh, of each party. With this, I would switch to the uh, next topic of documentation. What is the role of uh, documentation in transfer pricing? So uh, just for fun's sake, I included three questions. Is it a report of the related party transactions in the air? Or is it an opinion? Or is it a document to defend the client? So what do you think it would be? Just type your answers in the chat box. Let's start with that. So most of the people are of the opinion that we are defending the client by preparing a transfer pricing report, or sometimes even preparing a report of the related party transactions. But uh, it's not uh, for defense only, it is for documentation to prove that we are doing the right thing. We are, uh, it's more of a compliance requ requirement. And in case of any dispute, 
yes definitely it's a document to defend ourselves okay so this document is prepared by the taxpayer who have related party transactions to prove that the transactions were done at arm's length the reason we prepared this is to uh, to keep uh, first of all to ensure that we are doing the right thing and secondly in case of any uh, uh, any question raised by the uh, tax authorities it is our first line of defense so if we have a proper documentation in place we can prove that yes we have followed the transfer price regulations and we are in compliance with the tp now there are few steps which are mentioned by oecd uh, for the basic documentations which should uh, the pointers for covering to uh, to ensure that we have a good quality documentation these pointers i'll just highlight here before i get into the details of what are the documents required by tp so uh, the first thing is that it should mention the period what are the years to be covered in the documentation second is it should mention the broad based analysis of the taxpayer circumstances for example the taxpayer is uh, a manufacturer or a distributor and uh, what circumstances they are uh, operating who are, who is funding them uh what is their uh, global policies who are the shareholders then review of the control transactions under examination for uh, the it should encompass what are the transactions they are doing for example a company in uh, uae is selling to a company in europe or a company in india is selling to a company in uae and then uh, those goods are processed here and then further sold to other regions or sold locally so the control transactions under examination should be covered the next thing is what we have just discussed and we were very good in discussing that is the transfer pricing methodology so we uh, the next step is that we should mention about the transfer price method what method we have chosen why we have chosen it is based more on the uh, functional analysis and the economic analysis so we come out with the transfer pricing method and that should be part of our tp documentation next is the comparables so as we discussed in the cup method the comparable uncontrolled price so wh what are the external comparables we have taken and why what are the next step is it should also uh, include the review of existing inter internal comparables for example a company in uae they are selling goods to different regions in the world sorry for selling to india the margin is let's say 10% whereas for selling to uh, australia the margin is 1% so they should have a documentation that for the internal comparables why uh, what are the basic what are the basis for having the correct transfer pricing then the benchmarking study benchmarking study is very very common in tp environment which encompasses the benchmarking of a similar transaction happening in the region and the tax authorities normally have uh, refer to the benchmarking uh, for accepting the range of margin which is applied on the related party transactions so benchmarking is also a part of the tp documentation next is making adjustments wherever appropriate wherever the transfer pricing uh, uh, we come up with a certain conclusion that the price is undercharged or overcharged and an adjustment needs to be the, the, uh, needs to be made so that adjustments the basis quantum also forms a part of the tp documentation the last is the the data collected to make sure that the arms length uh, uh, remuneration is properly followed for example in case of a central treasury we are having a remuneration given to the administrator for the central funds so what is the basis of uh, reaching that that also forms part of the arms uh, of the documentation now we will go uh, step by step to see the 
documents which are required. This was just an overview of the features of the transfer based documentation. So as we say, it's a three tier documentation. I have although included four here. So I'll uh, go one by one. One, what is three tier documentation? Three tier documentation is, uh, it includes the master file, the local file, and the CBCR reporting. And the fourth is the other key areas which regulators can uh, cover. And this can, this can include anything like, uh, what are what is the threshold for TP documentation? What is the, uh, how to uh, identify the related parties or any other thing which the FTA might come up with. So that will also form part of the TP documentation. So I repeat, so the three tier documentation includes the master file, local file and the CBCR. CBCR, we all know it's already in place since 2019. Now, what are the key components of a master file? The master file is a top level view of the MNE groups TP practices. It takes care it, the global and economic environment, legal environment, financial structure, and text contents uh, of the MNE group uh, is also mentioned in the master file. So, what all top level view is there in the MNE group? Let's go one by one. It includes an executive summary of the ownership structure. Who is the UBO of the company? How is the company held locally? Uh, what is, who is the intermediary company? So that helps the tax authorities in, in understanding that by routing, uh, by not routing the TP transactions properly, how, how can the group uh, benefit? What is the tax planning they could have done? in routing the TP transactions. Then the next is the group analysis, a profile of the multinational group, what all products, services they provide globally, what is the profile of the group, where in which all countries they are present. Then the group's global industry policy, the organizational structure of the MNE group by function, like uh, which entity is doing the manufacturing, distribution, sales, marketing, HR, IT, so an, an organizational structure of the many group and its analysis. The next point covered in the master file is the description of the MNE's business and industry in which it operates. For example, FMCG, they could be uh, manufacturing chocolates, even breads, or they could have uh, poultry farms supplying milk where the price is very much standardized. So that has to be formed part of the value chain analysis and how the, how the different, uh, 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 different departments in the group are ad adding value to the product. Then the group's TP policy, the financial and tax position, how many tax uh, cases they have open globally for anything or what is the financial position of the company, of the group, sorry, how they are financed, who is, uh, providing them support. This all needs to be covered in the master file. Then the, the next is the conclusion that how they feel that they are compliant with the group, uh, with the policies of the group they have designed internally. And the next year and appendix, which will have details of the points which, we, which I've mentioned above. The next thing to consider other than the master file is the local file. The local file is, uh, it, uh, it has a detailed transaction transfer documentation specific to the country. Whereas master file, we were talking of the group. Now we are talking more at the country level. It provides information of the intercompany transactions and the analysis which the company has performed to, uh, to choose the right uh, method for determining the transfer pricing. It also uh, uh, include documentation for each transaction. For example, uh, initially the company was manufacturing company. Now they are also providing services to its customer. That also needs to be formed part of the local file, how they are 
uh, ensuring that the transfer pricing rules are complied. Uh, the FAR analysis is also part of the local file, which is covered by Stay earlier. Now, the last uh, in the TP documentation is the CBCR requirement. Now, CBCR requirement are already in place here since uh, last three years. And it uh, the country by country reporting is uh, applicable to the companies uh, for their group operations. And it, it is a report of the revenue, uh, profit, taxes paid in each jurisdiction. It helps the tax authorities in understanding if there's a uh if the if under beps they are moving the profit from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction to save on the taxes it also uh, includes the requirements like uh, the number of employees the capital the assets held in each jurisdictions and cbcr has got its own reporting requirements i am not getting into that but uh, just an overview, it includes the allocation of income, uh, employees, taxes, the group uh, of the group, entire group, and how the how it is split. So in UAE, if uh, the CBCR is required to be filed by ultimate parent entity, if it is uh, uh, or any alternate entity, if it is appointed by it. Now. This is the last slide uh, from my side, and I'm just going to talk about the road ahead, how we need to prepare for the TP. So we need to do a high level impact analysis where we do the mapping of the related party transactions and understand the TP risks and exposure relating to the pricing we have at a group level. Second is the detailed analysis to confirm that the initial impact analysis is correct. This can be done once the legislation is out. Third is the implementation of the TP policies to amend the contracts policies. For example, a lot of times intercompany transactions are not documented by a contract. What is the margin they are charging between intercompany transactions, whether those are happening at arm's length or not. Uh, most of the time it is not documented. Even for funding, sometimes it is done through current account and not through the capital account. And the last is we need to ensure the compliance by doing the three tier documentation, prepare master file, local files, and, and ensure that we are compliant with the TP. So if you have any questions, we will take it through the Q&A uh, uh, time. So now I hand over to uh, Rishi Chavla. So I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rishi Agarwal and Sne for a wonderful session. Uh, I'm so happy that it, this has happened just before the lunch time. So people are still awake and listening. And I, I know this is a lot to take in the first session, but what it is, it is. We have to do it at some stage. Right. Um, so before we go into Q&A session, I just want to talk a little bit about the way forward and how companies can look at, uh, you know, planning before the copy tax is, uh, is, in, is been, I mean, the public documentation is out there, but when the law is out and the regulations come out. Okay, so basically the process is quite straightforward. Basically, I think Rishi already discussed a little bit on that, that you have to start with the impact assessment. I think one of the important uh, thing which I felt uh, uh, one needs to look at is the arms length pricing, especially the transfer with the with the related parties. So m &E and the multinational companies he has already explained uh, your related party how to deal with it. But at the same time, what is important to see is if you have a free zone company and you have a related party which is in the mainland, so there is domestic transfer pricing also to be looked at. Now the question is why it is required to be looked at. Very simple, that a free zone is most likely expected to be 0%, whereas the mainland will be 9%. So the transaction between these two related parties still has to be seen because this can have, this can have a, a, an impact very easily. And as you might have noted that even free zones are, are going to be 0% uh, 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 corporate tax. It also means that they have to register for corporate tax. So, so considering that, that is something to, to think about right away. And another thing I want to see, you have to also look at whether you have ongoing contracts uh, with the related parties or not, because just, just having uh, a high level introduction uh, in understanding of funding each other is not good enough anymore. You have to get into contracts. So look at that part. Um, 
Other areas which, which I think are important to understand here is that the, for example, policies on depreciation, uh, policies on the carry forward of losses, whether you can claim it or not claim it, or, you know, all the past losses, of course, when the seat is out, you cannot just take it forward straight away. But going forward, there will be policies, I mean, there will be certain rules around it because some of the uh, regimes, they allow 100% carry forward of losses, but not all. Right then, you have to all. There are certain you know differences between the the audit financials and what you report in the corporate tax. That like depreciation I just mentioned, carry forward losses is another one. There can be areas such as um, related party finance costs. It, it is there. If we go into goes into the TP transaction, there can be changes on account. So you have to look at how to handle those things because it should not happen that you can create another complex situation in front of you. So it's important in your audit financial, you have to pay attention uh, to the fact that your transaction should be in line with corporate tax. So it's easier to handle it when the law is out. Another important thing is, of course, the training level of the team, because it's not one man job. The general expectation is that the CFO or the finance manager is going to take care of it. Uh, what I feel is that if it is not been delegated properly to the team level, it becomes too much to handle at the top level. So that's important things to consider. Uh, another area which I think that was not for today, but uh, we didn't go in very detail, but there's a possibility of forming tax groups. So you have to see if you want to follow a tax group or not. Unlike VAT, there's a difference that once you form a tax group, you cannot break it. Uh, so these are some of the things you need to consider. That also comes in the impact, uh, impact assessment stage. And the next stage is about assessment and design. Then you look at, you know, there are a lot of expenses which could be allowable and unallowable expenses. It's important to, to look at your p and and see what expenses can be justified and what not. And then, of course, the law will explain us more. So this, the second stage can be done when the law is out. And, when, and then we comes to the implementation. Documentation is going to be the key, especially in the corporate tax. Uh, because that is at the net profit margin level. So sales was easy in the VAT. Okay, fine. Top line sales, that's all. But in the corporate in the corporate tax, we are looking at the full P&L and the balance sheet. So that's very important. Okay, so that's it uh, with very basic level. So just to give you, like we do help in the impact study assessment uh, stage and the transfer pricing and the benchmarking thing. So if you get into that uh, kind of uh, an issue, please feel free to get in touch with us. So we'll get into questions now. Uh, the first question uh, we have, it's from Moen. Uh, so I think um, if Sne, are you, are you there? Uh, and Rishi, if you can please uh, put on your video so we can take up those questions. Yeah, I'm there. Right, okay. So the first question from Moen is, um, uh, whether the selection of method for transfer pricing is based on the outcome of function analysis or there is something independent or different? That's the question. Uh, I would I would say that it's not only the outcome of the functional analysis, but it mostly depends on the business model, that what kind of business model is there in that particular transaction. So let's say if there is a sale of goods between the two group entities, so we have to see that sale of goods is a standard product. If it's a standard product, maybe there is an internal cup available, or if not internal cup, maybe uh, external cup, because it's a standard product. But if that is not a standard product, that's a unique product, then maybe we have to go for TNNMM, okay? Or maybe if it's a process, then we have to go for a cost plus method. So it's it's functional analysis is part of everything, but the Selection of method will depend on what kind of comparisons you have uh, available. And then you can say little much uh, part of functional analysis as well, because we have to see how much is the, because of functional analysis, there can be various adjustments happening in the price, which we are getting from the um, uh, method. Not only the uh, method is dependent on that. Okay, right. So hope you, you got your answer. Yes, right. Thank you. Thank you, Sne. Um, Rishi, if you can take the next one. Um, if a company is providing any of the services or supply of goods to a related party, what documents we can request to clients for testing the arm's length and take the appropriate uh, decision? This is asked by Rolvin. 
So uh, first of all, we need to understand the relationship uh, between the related parties, whether uh, the company is actually governing and the related party transaction uh, uh, relationship is established. Once it is established, then we need to see the pricing as uh, whether the, the pricing is comparable with the other uh, with the with our uh, level of knowledge of business and the industry which we have to uh, and uh, and ask the client to produce the documentation which they have done their initial uh, analysis of uh, their economic analysis and transactions which they are doing with third parties the external cup uh, uh, the internal cup would be the most uh, easiest thing to refer in this case to understand whether they are uh, following the same basis of pricing with related parties or not right thank so you if so they much. have a comparable uncontrolled uh, transaction uh, to justify that they are following the same basis of prices yes it's easy to uh, agree on the transfer pricing right okay so there's uh, there's another question which is sent is that uh, uh, basically it's about transactions between free zone and mainland so can you uh, give a little bit uh, uh, little bit of high level uh, discussion on the trans what's going to happen on transaction between free zones and mainland sne you like to take up yeah so what's the question that uh, how the transaction will happen between mainland and uh, free zone so what are the implications on uh, means on implication on those transaction from view of corporate tax so if if we need to understand uh, uae has come with 9% corporate tax rate uh, for all the mainland companies and free zone companies if they meet the criteria which is the eligible criteria of uh, that they are doing the transactions only with the uh, outside world or with the free zone companies then they can be subject to 0% tax rate so that's the difference between the taxability of free zones eligible free zones i'll say and the mainland companies now let's come to the transactions so if there is any transaction happening between mainland and free zone okay so if uh, free zone is doing some sales of goods or services to the mainland company then they will uh, not be eligible any more to get that uh, advantage of 0% tax rates because they are not allowed to do transaction because that was not the uh, for the purpose it was created originally the free zones so that's the main impact that if free zones do any sale purchase transaction with mainland they will lose the advantage and if uh, like uh, ma free zone uh, uh, it's opposite that mainland is doing any uh, sale or goods of services to the free zone then it doesn't make any difference as such because they are anyhow subject to 9% tax rates and this i am not talking about uh, intra group transactions uh, or related party transactions i am talking about the general transactions and if right. they are doing any uh, related party transaction then they will sub they will be subject to tp uh, because they have to justify that the transaction is correct because one uh, one um, like mainland is having high tax and free zone is having a low tax rate so tp would be always subject to tp regulations whether they uh, do uh, whether the free zone is doing with mainland or mainland would be doing with the free zone right so that's another complex situation to deal with i'm sure we'll we'll do well right we are just well, we are exactly at 130 but i have one or two more questions so if if somebody is get, getting late you, you you may feel free to Uh, uh to to go if you like to otherwise you can stay um so rishi there is another question um, you know in the audit financials we very commonly see this shareholders current account and the, and the loans so so what do you think about it um is, is there going to be any issues with the uh, uh, uh you know those balances there without interest and you know there can be some interest at different rates like you know it can change as you wish so what do you think about that balance see most of the times we see that uh, the entities in uae are uh, having a very limited share capital which is uh, 300000 in case of a dd company or 50000 for the free zones and people don't uh, and uh, normally companies don't go and increase the share capital even if there's a need to do so 
the normal practice is that the companies are funded through the shareholders account and the equity remains there as a payable balance in the books which sometimes uh, is classified as equity or not classified but it remains as a credit balance in the books now with the tp regulations if we see that the companies who are being funded by the head office and the, that is not classified as equity then definitely there should be it should be classified as a loan and there should be an interest payment on that it, at par with the market conditions to make sure that the financing is proper in the company so having said this i would like to summarize it by saying yes it is going to have an impact superb so that's another interesting thing to look into okay so another question uh, uh, sne uh, i have two only last two questions so we'll wrap up with that uh, so just be another a minute or so uh, sne is benchmarking to be done at gcc level or at global level what do you think so benchmarking is something which is to be done which is nearest to the uh, transaction which we have so if uh, we have a transaction in let's say in uae if we get a benchmarking of a uae company there is nothing like that if we don't have any uae example then we go to move to gcc level if we get any similar transaction at gcc level with similar circumstances and if we don't get gcc then only we move to the uh, other countries where we get these transaction so it it requires that you get a nearest situation which which is very much uh, the same condition same structure same business model that is a requirement so more uh, near to the geographical location you get is better but if you don't get you can move to the other uh, jurisdictions right uh, i think jaspreet has a question jaspreet you, would you like to ask that question because your question is quite long so should i just uh, request you to please ask that question one second yeah just please have uh, hi rishi thank you. you can hear me yes we can see you and uh, hear you we can see you with cheeta but we can hear you definitely please okay fine, fine, fine okay i have not put on my video my question uh, is uh, you were showing us one slide that one company was in india and the same owners one company is in a free zone dubai okay so now the free my question is the free zone dubai company is not dealing with any mainland company so as per the corporate tax law it will be having a 0% uh, percent tax right yes if they are, they are like meeting the eligibility conditions they would be having yeah. a 0% percent. so because they will not deal that uh, the dubai free zone company will not deal with any company so as per corporate tax it will be 0 so now you had said that uh tp transfer pricing comes into the picture that they are hiding any tax so now in this case the corporate com- uh, the free zone company is not going to hide any tax they are going to sell to a us party or a london party and it will be a third party transaction so in this case if they are buying from india and selling to third party is it uh, coming under tp both the parties are unrelated parties indian company and ue no, uh, no, 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 it's a related party it's a related party if it is a related party yes it will be subject to tp 0% tax doesn't matter it's a tp regulation so any if every country has a different regulation uh, so ue is also coming with their own tp regulation it doesn't matter uh, because even if they are free zone company they are subject to 0% tax they have to file the returns right so when they have to file the returns they will be uh, and there is a related party transaction if the tp law says that if you have a related party transaction you have to justify through filing the tax returns uh, tp uh, tax returns or tp reports so then they they are subject to that maybe they will not get any kind of uh, like uh, implications because of that but they have to do the procedures of documentation and all the analysis fine fine and at this stage there is no uh, they have not defined the government has not defined uh, how the tp has to be submitted or something like no, no, they have... will come out with the law for that fine thanks thank you everyone A- amazing session thanks once again to both the rishis and sneha thank you thanks uh, thanks jaspreet so the last question of the day is um, if if employees are given an interest free loan would tp have an impact on this sneha you can answer this if you like to 
if employees have a uh, uh, having given a loan, loan yeah if employees are given interest free loan would transfer pricing have an impact on this if it's a uh, employee purely an employee then it's not a transfer no. pricing transaction because tp means it has to happen between the related party but if the employee is a relative of the owner or it comes into the definition of four kinship which uh, which is which includes the relatives and all then it will be subject to transfer pricing transaction uh, regulations yeah rishi you want to add something to this no no it's fine uh, uh, because this is on the related parties associated parties and employees are not part of that right okay thank you very much i think this answers your question and with that we end up end this session and uh, and stay in touch we are going to post do the recording we post the recording on the uh, in the web on the website and we'll share that with you and we'll have more sessions um, in the coming months so so looking forward to see you again uh, in the next uh, next webinar or physical seminar as we plan so goodbye goodbye for now thank you very much bye bye thank you everyone thanks for attending thank you, thank you. bye